And I want to say thank you, Roger, for running back, um, for having us steal you away uh, from essentially commerce and transaction cookies. cookies. And so that's going to be the topic of our panel. And so just to refresh everyone, I'm going to have each of the panelists introduce themselves and give us one thought as they introduce themselves about adoption of Bitcoin Cash, their number one thought, starting with Josh. So I'm Josh Althorpe, I'm senior engineer at Coinbase, and when it comes to adoption, the first step is every single person in this room, making sure that we spread the need for people to accept and be able to transact with Bitcoin Cash. My name's uh, Justice Ranveer, I'm the lead architect at Stash, and uh, in terms of spreading Bitcoin, Bitcoin adoption, Bitcoin Cash adoption, same thing, right? Uh, I think the, the most important focus is we need wallets that focus on the workflows and the needs of the people who want to use the money. And, uh, I'm Roger Veer. Uh, I was the first person in the world to start investing in Bitcoin startups. Currently, I'm the CEO of Bitcoin.com and can't wait to spread Bitcoin cash to the world. So I'm Lorian uh, Gamaroff, the CEO and co-founder of Centpi, and our whole entire focus is trying to get people to use uh, Bitcoin Cash for payments. And I think that, uh, you know, we've seen a lot of cool uh, technology. We see what Enchain is doing and we see what uh, all the guys at ABC and Unl Unlimited and everyone's doing. But uh, right now we need cool products, something that uh, everybody, you know, and, and their grandmother can use, Some something that's simple and really fun to use. And I think we can take a lot of, uh, we can learn a lot from the, the apps that we all have in our pockets already today, like WhatsApp and Twitter and so on. If we can build a product that works and looks like that, then we'll get traction. My name is Ken Shishido. I'm co-organizer for Tokyo Bitcoin Meetup since 2013. I personally hosted over 170 meetups in Tokyo. Um, in, the, in addition to uh, merchant adoption and improved UIs, maybe um, we need more girls' power in the Bitcoin space yeah, to have the more balance and different <laughs> There you go. The congregation says amen, Ken. <laughs> Okay, so thank you very much. A pleasure to meet you all. All right, so um, w one of the things we you know, really no notice is that everybody in this audience has a mobile phone, okay? Um, but not necessarily everybody in this audience has a mobile wallet. Why do you think that is? And what can we do to fix that problem? So I guess I'll just jump in. Um, I think that the number one problem is really uh, what Lauren said is the killer app, right? People are used to using Venmo and these other things that integrate with their native contact list. Their friends are easy to contact and they can send fiat to things without knowing an address or any complicated behavior. So when it comes down to it, I should be able to go into my contacts and say I want to send them money. And it shouldn't be, uh, I need to worry about a receive address or anything complicated. And it needs to be so transparent that someone that has no idea that they're sending crypto is able to transfer value and that it happens over the crypto networks. It's all about ease of use. It's about transparent usage. And I think that's really the key to the next level of adoption for us. I'll, I'll add a little bit more to that. Okay. So. Uh, I completely agree with what Josh said. We need to make the apps as easy as we possibly can, to, in the best user experience we possibly can. But the other side of that is we need to make the network itself provide the best user experience we possibly can, which means fast, cheap, irreversible, reliable transactions. And Bitcoin Cash has that. And I think that's why all of us are on this stage are, are such big fans of Bitcoin Cash. So we have the apps and the, and the, the user interface side of things be mm -hmm. as easy as possible. Right. And we have the network itself be as user friendly as possible and Bitcoin Cash the devs behind that are actually have that in mind, whereas on other coins, maybe not so much. There you go. Anyone else? Well, Josh actually stole my answer, so. <laughs> Shame uh, on you, Josh. You know, I was gonna talk about the fact that um, wallets, w wallets, the, uh, the original first generation wallets were designed around the needs of Bitcoin transactions. You need public keys, so you have public key managers. Addresses are just a synonym for public keys, really. And we need to transition to contact-based uh, interactions, and which those don't necessarily just include simple payments. Um, 
I guess, how many people in the audience understand the term net 30 billing? More than I expected, actually. Let's just say like maybe 10%. Um, if you want Bitcoin used as money, uh, the final end user payments are just the last step of a very deep supply chain. And so we also need the business logic tools. We need the tools that a business uses to interact with their suppliers, to build the lines of credit and settle settle those out on the on the terms they're used to. You know, things like uh, trade credit, net billing, those exist for a reason. And uh, we need more people, no, no, we need less people who understand that so that I can build the solutions. <laughs> so disregard what I just said. Uh, but yeah, ultimate, ultimately we need uh, full supply chain penetration. And that will, in, that will involve things a lot different than just uh, uh, easy to use end user apps. Lauren? Okay, so here's the question. If we know uh, what we need to do and we have the technology, what's stopping us from delivering this today? I'll address that. So um, I think we built a whole bunch of the technology to do that. And then the protocol layer side of it got distorted and was no longer user friendly. <laughs> Excuse me. And that made it so the end users had a bad experience. And now we're having to rebuild and redo a lot of the work that we've already done in the past. But we've already done it once, and we can do it again, and we're going to do it again. And the fact that all of us are in this room today shows that we're going to do it again. And we're going to do it even faster than we did the last time. So Bitcoin Cash has only been around, what, seven months now. We already have a whole bunch of wallets. We have hundreds of thousands of merchants around the world accepting it. We have just about every exchange around the world accepting it. Look at how fast we've been moving. We're moving faster than the last time around, and we're going to do it faster, better, and cheaper, and more reliably than uh, Bitcoin Core, for sure, because they actually have the wrong goals in mind. Okay. All right. Yep. So uh, the whole space, even though it's been around for nine years, ten years, um, I think people have lost track or, or lost the whole notion that Bitcoin is money. You know, uh, it's all. It's now. Uh, when I see the the people who are in this space, who are working in the space, they've got even funding in this space. They're not actually working on money products. They're they're working on token products, or uh, they they're trying to do all these things like the crypto cats and so on, smart contracts. You know, a lot of this, the, the 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 developers who have the ability to work in this space, uh, it's not on money. You know, the the whole idea was cash. That was what it was all about. And uh, now it's blockchain and, and the million things you can do with blockchain. So it's almost like all the, the potential that was uh, there in the beginning, all the smart guys and all the girls that, that were, were excited about cash got distracted by all this other mad stuff. So uh, it's almost like, uh, you know, when I, when I thought about how Bitcoin Cash was the second coming, it was a, a revival of this notion that all this is about money. That's what it was all about. And I think that hopefully we can now get back a lot of that, uh, that smartness from the, the community to start building out money products. Because, uh, again, it's all, it's all been diverted into what I think is largely a, a red herring trail, you know, trying to figure out how to decentralize everything, whether it, it should be or not. So I'm, I'm so delighted that Bitcoin Cash has reminded us that it is about money and this is what, uh, where the excitement should be. And for those that don't believe it, read the title of the white paper. It's right there in the title. Yeah, I would say that um, there's, there are definitely people in the world who want Bitcoin to be money for various reasons. And for every one of those reasons, there's a lot of vested interest who do not want it to become money. And the second group is far more well-resourced than the first. And so... In terms of um, a simple task like creating an entirely new uh, monetary system and the corresponding economy that goes with it, uh, you're going to be short of resources to begin with. And then uh, you have to contend with the fact that the uh, interests who would be disrupted and don't want to adapt to the new system are going to try to buy up your talent and get them working on other projects that either, even if they don't directly hinder you, at least just take the talent away and have them doing something else. And on top of that, uh, you have a lot of people in the world who um, 
they, they have that eternal regret of, I didn't buy enough Bitcoins early enough. And some people get over that and move on with their lives, and other people get fixated on it and say, lightning can, you know, I can catch lightning in a bottle again. It's not going to happen in Bitcoin, so I'll launch an ICO, and maybe I'll get the returns that I would have got if I bought Bitcoin in 2010. And I, I think there's, I think there, there's, uh, a lot of, I don't think you I don't think you get those people back. I think they're just always going to pursue that until they g give up, which could be decades from now. So we just have to build what we can with what we have. Got it. Thank you. So, All right. uh, go ahead, Josh. So I have a slightly different take on it. And it's one of the downsides of decentralized development and us talking about these decentralized blockchains is that we have development teams that are working in isolation from one another. We have BIPs, but then the BIPs aren't universally supported across wallets. I may have an identity system in one wallet that I use that doesn't work in another wallet. So the consistency of experience across the product lines between the, the wallet vendors actually would be a huge benefit to the industry. And it's difficult because you want to be on the same page, but a lot of people are so focused on the decentralized part of the currency, they don't see the benefits to standards and working together to make sure that we have consistent experiences. And to echo Roger's point about the networks functioning correctly, they have to be consistent. It has to be consistent from app to app. The fees have to be consistent from transaction to transaction. And that consistency is what brings a user to trust and continue to use that system over time. So what I'd, I'd encourage is the wallet manufacturers and wallet developers to really look at the entire ecosystem and think outside of the scope of just their wallet. How does their wallet interact with their, the other wallets in the ecosystem? Do they work easily together? Because us as users, we like choices, and we're not all going to use the same solutions. So they have to play well together. Awesome. Thank you, Josh. And Josh, since you gave us such an awesome answer, I'm going to put you a little bit of a hot seat here. <laughs> all right. Josh, how many users does Coinbase have? <laughs> So I don't have exact numbers for you. Range, brother. Okay, so probably <laughs> approximately 20 million. Woo! Hold on. Okay, that's a that's a big number. Now, how do us app developers in Bitcoin Cash get to write apps that we can target those 20 million Coinbase users? So the reality is just consistency and making sure that the specs are clear between everyone, right? I'm really excited about what BitPay did, but they had two options. They had a way to do a backward compatible BIP72 version of their wallet that would have worked across the entire ecosystem, or they could have chosen BIP70 is what they rolled out, and only a small segment of the ecosystem could get the benefit of the 100,000 merchants that they onboarded. So we have to think about how people are using these products and make sure that the tools that the user needs to use are available to them well in advance of the services requiring them. And that takes a level of coordination and really making sure that you know, we're working together and planning these things together, even if we're going to be developing different new solutions to these problems. So in essence, we, if we take your position, um, the Bitcoin Cash community can answer your call. Um, will, will coin, does that make it easy for us to get Coinbase to say, hey, there are great Bitcoin Cash apps that Coinbase users can use? Is that a pathway so, so to that? The truth is, is that we want to provide fiat solutions for users, and we're not a wallet. People use us as a wallet, but that's not our primary business model. And so we encourage people to have their own, own private keys. Go and install a wallet where you control the funds and use us as a fiat gateway. That's great. And you get the best of both worlds. You get the ability to have a good exchange rate and get your crypto and start interacting within that economy. And then you can own your own private keys and have an amazing wallet that you control. And you can have both. And growing the pie is way better than fighting over a slice. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> Ken, all right, you're grounded here in Tokyo, um, in which you've seen some of the most advanced uses of mobile wallets and mobile apps possibly in the world. Um, what do you think we can learn from you know, the Tokyo J Japanese approach to mobile wallet technology that may, we may not be aware of from what you've seen? Mobile wallet technologies? Um, you know, I'm just use cases. You know, I'm just trying to say, hey, here's another 
you know, Japan and Tokyo, it's another world. We may not have a full visual into it. Is there anything that we can learn? Uh, okay. Um, this uh, Satoshi Vision conference has been aired on uh, nightly news at 11 p.m. nightly news on Friday. So it's uh, really clearly we are moving into mainstream and we are no longer a bunch of geeks anymore. <laughs> So um, I've been in Bitcoin space for some time, and one thing I learned is that I cannot change other people. I can only change myself. So we, these uh, mainstream users, they don't really care about decentralization, open source, you know, elliptic curve, and all these crazy terms we use. So one of the uh, proposal I recently submit is uh, to call one millionth of Bitcoin as cash, uh, new denomination, because uh, $3 uh, uh, Starbucks latte is going to be 0 0.003 BCH, correct? And we started using Telegram tip, tip bot, right? We send back and forth 0.00. .00 three BCH, bracket three dollars. This is so crazy for, I mean, it's too impossible for, for new users uh, to, to adapt when we use decimal points. So one millionth to be called as cash, uh, Starbucks coffee is going to be 3,000 cash today. And uh, when big BTC becomes 1,000 fold in five years, it's going to be three cash. Uh, yeah, BCH goes, yeah, right. So yeah, we don't have to use another denomination and uh, um, let's see, and we can differentiate using bits, uh, uh, differentiate using uh, cash from uh, bits used in BTC. So, so you say co-opt cash, let's just go for it. All right, there you go. Either you're in or you're out, right? There you go. Okay. Um, we talked, Josh mentioned a little bit about Venmo as a possible use case. Um, coming back now to use cases that are really, that you guys have all seen and, um, you know, you've seen get people involved in, you know, Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash. Are there any particular use cases, you know, that you would say, hey, you know, we need another Venmo for Bitcoin Cash today, or we need something else. Um, I know you mentioned CryptoKitties, but there's demand there. You know, maybe we need a CryptoKitties for Bitcoin Cash. Uh, any particular use cases, gambling, I mean, whatever you've seen that you said, listen, these are the use cases that are generating interest and demand from the greater population. I, I can answer that, I think so. And uh, the answer's actually been basically the same for maybe four years now. And there's a fantastic website called purse.io that just recently announced that full support for Bitcoin Cash is coming. Woo, there you go. And for anybody in this room who doesn't know what purse.io is, it's a website that allows people to arbitrage Amazon store credit, which has a net effect so that any Bitcoin Cash holder soon will be able to get a 15, 20, 25% discount on every single purchase from Amazon. That is a big deal and that is a substantial discount amount. And that's enough to get everybody who's not interested in financial privacy and cryptography and cypherpunks and this and that. They can save $20 on their next $100 purchase on Amazon. Boom, they will become a user. And that's a fantastic use case. And uh, I'll tell people a little bit more about what I have going on. So uh, I recently, actually not so recent anymore, but a while back I became a citizen of a country called St. Kitts in the Caribbean. There's uh, less than 50,000 people living there. Everybody shops on Amazon. We just imported four Bitcoin Cash ATM machines into the country. We're going to spread them all over the place. So that's probably the highest per capita Bitcoin ATM ratio of any country in the world by far. And we're going to tell them all about purse.io and show them how to use these machines to save money on Amazon. And I think there's a really good chance we can get just about every single person in this country using Bitcoin Cash probably by the end of this year, because it will spread like wild, wildfire, because there's not a single person out there who doesn't love to save money. And if you can save money and use Bitcoin Cash by doing it, 
everybody, even if they're not a crypto nerd, is going to be using Bitcoin Cash. So watch how we're going to do it there. Yes, so. All right. Nice work. So I, I definitely echo that sentiment. Discounts and providing a better price point by using cryptocurrencies is a great adoption mechanic. Another thing is, is products that are only sold in Bitcoin Cash. So encouraging artists to sell their next CD exclusively in Bitcoin Cash. Fashion designers to put out items of their next season's fashionable accessories only available in Bitcoin Cash. And trying to encourage people to make things not available in other currencies forces people to take the plunge as long as the user experience is right. Now, it still can't be complex. It still can't be about cryptography and all of these complex topics that we love to talk about. The average uh, user just doesn't care about those things. But if the, the only way they can get that handbag is by using Bitcoin Cash, or the only way that they can get their favorite artist's work is Bitcoin Cash, it's another avenue that we can have that is a unique differentiator. So in, in Africa, you know, we, we've, we've got such a perfect storm of events there that, that uh, will just naturally lead people to use it. We're so uh, uh, um, excited about the, the possibility because people are used to mobile money and because it costs so much money to, to, to send uh, across border, you know, we, as soon as we launch, we, we really think that it's going to be this there's going to be this huge demand just to start picking up uh, Bitcoin Cash to be able to, to send money instead of paying 15%, you know, to pay 1%. So uh, we think that uh, uh, it's going to be this, this kind of tsunami of, of uh, uh, people rushing into Bitcoin Cash. And I I'm hope that uh, in the months to come, you know, uh, I can give you guys a report back on, on what's been happening there. But uh, we're going to be able to un undercut every single money transfer operator in that, in, in within Africa. Uh, I mean, it's impossible for them to, to compete. And the fact that we've been engaging our regulators, and that's why I made such a point of it, you know, th uh, that we've been able to uh, show them that this is not this dark market thing. You know, we can actually uh, report whatever information they want. And uh, for the vast majority of customers who are going to be using the service, you know, it's, uh, they're, they're going to be at that level where it, they don't need any reporting. You know, if you're mo moving $1,000 a month or something, you know, uh, that's not going to be the issue. Obviously, the regulators are looking for the higher value transactions. So we're going to be able to really undercut everybody there. We're going to outcompete everybody, and there's going to be this massive drive. So really, look to, towards the end of this year, I think you're going to start seeing massive volumes th uh, flowing, uh, especially you know, from, uh, from the sub-Saharan uh, uh, part of Africa. And uh, uh, that's why I'm very, 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 very bullish on um, Bitcoin Cash, uh, just because of what we've been, we've been able to do there and, what, uh, 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 and, the, and the acceptance, especially from the regulatory environment. That is going to be the, the key that drives adoption there, getting that kind of stamp of approval. All right, Eustace? Well, all, all these are good use cases so far. Um, one, of the, one of the long time use cases uh, that I've thought about ever since, uh, ever since Bitcoin really got rolling is the idea of remote freelancing. You know, any service that can be delivered remotely via the internet is a perfect case for getting paid in Bitcoin. So there, uh, for people who are getting paid in dollars, there's a website called Fiverr, which is mainly a matchmaking site that helps uh, people who are looking for small freelance tasks find people willing to provide it. Something along those lines, maybe not exactly that model, but that uh, uh, help, helps, helps people who want to freelance uh, internationally cross-border, find customers, and maybe do some uh, just uh, support for them to make it easier to run their business, that can grow a... Uh, a class of native, native Bitcoin businesses that can't really um, exist any other way. Thank you. All right, quick question for you guys now on the topic of privacy. Um, you know, it's some of the other chains that shall not be named. You know, privacy has been an excuse for making certain decisions. Um, do you think privacy is important for greater customer adoption, um, mobile or otherwise? So um, I think one of the characteristics that make money money is fungibility. 
And fungibility is just another way of saying privacy. So in order for something to be useful as money, it has to be fungible. And in order for something to be fungible, it has to be private. So it's just, it's not good or bad. That's what money is. Just like the fact that gravity makes things fall down and not up, that's the way the world works. It's the same when it comes to money. To, in order for something to be good money, is it has to be fungible. And fungibility is just another word for privacy. I'm actually going to have to disagree a little bit with Roger on this one. Okay, all right. Here we go. Uh, I, I've been waiting 25 years-ish for email encryption to take on, to catch on, and it hasn't worked so far. And over the year, recent years, I had to think, why hasn't that worked? And uh, it turns out that uh, user preferences, they have their hierarchy of preferences, they want their most immediate and pressing problems solved first. And we as privacy advocates, as much as we might want to, we can't actually force them to change those, uh, their, those priorities. We can't make them value privacy if they have more short-term uh, goals. So the approach I think we have to take, if, if we believe that privacy is a very important long-term goal, which I agree with you on that, I think we have to uh, we have to take the approach that we, the users will allow us to, uh, to, make, make, to make things more private as long as we solve all of their other higher priority problems first. So I look at it as a way of if, if we give a good user experience, if we solve the problems that they want solved and don't really impose on them, then we can build privacy in, into our applications. I don't think we disagree at all. Okay. <laughs> you know, the, the whole privacy thing, especially for the vast majority of users that are coming to the space, it's not an issue. You know, uh, uh, again, this is now coming from my experience from how regulators are treating these payment methods. You know, if you are going to be uh, moving a, a million dollars worth to an exchange, then of course that exchange is going to ask for information and possibly report on that. But for the vast majority of transactions that occur in Bitcoin Cash, uh, regulators don't care you know, um, if money is coming into a merchant uh, you know, below certain thresholds, and certainly below the thresholds that are, are the standard retail thresholds. Yes, if you're buying a Lambo, of course, uh, uh, you know, the, the Lambo uh, merchant is probably going to report on, on where that money's coming from. But Bitcoin is going to be treated as cash. So you know, if you go into a retail and you spend cash, that retailer is not going to say, where did you get that money from? And uh, so... Again, you know, we are all maybe care about these things because we've been in the space. We've been, you know, interested in, in how Bitcoin works and, and the privacy and that sort of thing. But um, really, when this goes mainstream, and, you know, that's when, because it certainly isn't now, even though the price is high. It's going, for the vast majority of people in the space, they're not going to ever care about the fact that, yes, that transaction might possibly be traced to a wallet that they own. It's pseudonymous. So that is, I think, far and enough. Uh, for most most people on the planet. All right, uh, want to take a slightly different position from that. You are right in the short term. Users are not thinking of privacy right now. They have more immediate pressing concerns that they want solved. Privacy is a it's a more of a long term risk that um, people they they won't care about it and they won't think about it until there's an emergency and they they really wish things had been done differently. And uh, the example that I'll use for that, uh, the, uh, the founder of Mozilla, back in the early 2000s, he made a donation to some political campaign he believed in at the time. And, you know, years went past, but, uh, you know, recently-ish, I don't remember how, how many years ago it was, but at some point, uh, that became an, an issue. Somebody who for whatever reason, uh, really disagreed with his choice, brought that up and caused a huge controversy and actually forced him out of his job, which uh, he then went on to start the Brave browser, which is doing great things. So maybe in the long run, it was okay. But at that moment when he was going through this crisis and being forced out of, his, uh, forced out of the company he founded, he probably wished that his donation way back however many years ago was a lot more private than it ended up being. Yes, but that wasn't a pseudonymous uh, transaction. That was a, a, a known transaction. He was he was doxxed at the time of right. the transaction. Right. But the, the, the principle, though, is that at the time of a transaction, the user might not have an immediate privacy concern, but you cannot predict in the future 
how you can't you can't judge how 15 years from the future how society will judge your behavior now because that can change rapidly is what we've seen so when you are building privacy into a project you're actually protecting the long-term interests of the users against problems that they don't even know that they might have and if you do your job right they'll never even know that it was a problem at all but we see how transactions are fungible because you, even though US marshals are selling tainted coins from you know drug dealers so it's not that that address can be traced to some user years down the line I mean even if even if your transaction can be traced to a Silk Road you know a, a coin that makes no difference because uh, we're treating uh, Bitcoin Cash as fungible. Right. Um, when I'm talking about privacy issues, I'm not necessarily talking about government regulations. Um, private actors, uh, I, I think we see in the, in the present tense, in the present time, we see way more censorship by private actors than by government actors. So it's not, um, you know, the... Yeah, yeah the, the, the U.S. Marshals and the regulators consider the coins fungible, but I would bet that Google, uh, and maybe to a lesser extent Facebook, knows a huge amount about uh, Bitcoin addresses and who they're connected to, just due to the fact that probably a lot of people communicate, send me, you know, send me to my address, and they send an email, and they use Gmail. There, um, the, the level of information that's known about who owns what Bitcoins um, the best data is probably not in the hands of the government. It's in the hands of uh, these large social media companies, and nobody knows how that information is going to be used in the next 10 years. Uh, you don't know who's going to uh, be in charge of these companies, what their uh, interests are going to be, and uh, how they will choose to act on that data. There's also the evolution of new products that are going to be coming out. Oh. There we go. Oh, is that better? All right. Lower it down a little lower. There. Maybe just hold it. How about this? That works better. <laughs> All right, but there's other privacy concerns as well. If I'm going to have be shipped something, then I'm going to have a shipping address associated with that. Eventually, we're going to have lending systems that are built on top of crypto systems that require them to have an identity attached so they understand who the person they're lending to is. And that data, even if it is pseudo-anonymous up front or only held by a certain company up front, can always be subpoenaed. There's always ways for them to get that data as well. So the number of avenues for them to get it are not just social media, but all of these other vectors. And if we make it so that fungibility or the privacy features of a coin are opt-in, then they know exactly what transactions to look at. So I'm a fan of fungibility long term, but I actually think that needs to happen for every single transaction. It needs to be consistent on the chain for everyone. And that way, that's just the way the coin works. That's the way that we do business rather than opt-in systems. And that being said, you know, mixers are great and other ways to increase fungibility are great when the fees are low. Those are definitely good ways that you can do that today, but ultimately we can strive for better. You mentioned in, uh, information that could be subpoenaed, mm -hmm. uh, and there are probably people who hear that and say, well, I don't care if I'm ever subpoenaed, I'm not going to do anything wrong, and that can be entirely true. But uh, in the last year, we have seen people kidnapped and held for ransom because they were known to hold large amounts of Bitcoins. So even if, even if for somebody who never, who's determined, I don't care, I'm not worried about it, the government ever coming down on me in any way whatsoever, uh, we've seen more private crime than we've seen state crime in terms of Bitcoins. Uh, you have to protect I disagree yourselves. with that. So Ross Holbrook's a pretty good example. He's locked in a cage. That's state crime against a peaceful individual. So there's been plenty of both private actors and state actors uh, aggressing against Bitcoin users. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, I, I'm certainly not a fan of Ross's situation. Um, I, I guess my point was... Uh, and th there's it actually another. To no, it, he wasn't. If I could add more, there's actually another more. Owning Bitcoin. There's an even more sympathetic victim. So there's a guy that sold bitcoins to some other guy in a Starbucks. I think it was in Michigan State or somewhere in that part of the U.S. And I think he just got like a seven-year prison sentence or something like that because it turned out the people that he was selling bitcoin to were undercover government agents, and they said, "Oh, you didn't get our permission slip to sell bitcoin." 
and uh, he's in jail right now. There's a heart-wrenching uh, YouTube video where he's talking about he has, you know, two kids that I think are like seven and 11, and the father's gonna be in jail for the next seven years because he sold Bitcoin to somebody who contacted him on local Bitcoins. And so that's another uh, fantastic and a horrible way example of state actors aggressing against Bitcoin users that haven't hurt anybody. He didn't buy or sell any drugs or do anything other than sell Bitcoin to somebody. And that guy's in jail right now today. And he's not the only one. This is happening all over the world. So don't think that, uh, that private kidnappers are your only uh, fears. There's all sorts of uh, state actors that are doing bad things to people that just want to live a, a happy life. I think we should oppose all the forms of kidnapping. <laughs> All right, um, I am now going to turn to my audience because we've been talking for a while and I just want to know, audience, is there anybody here with an awesome question for this awesome panel? Um, I'll try to grab Josh during the break, but I've, I've been talking to some wallet makers and, and people um, out there. They didn't really like my idea and they said it was impossible. But I'd like to see more collaboration between exchanges, wallets and merchants. And what I'd, what I'd like to see is be able to, like it's great that Amazon's giving us this discount. I'd like to be able to just have a wallet that gives me an incentive. Every time I spend Bitcoin cash, it automatically replaces it. Where there's an option that I can press that it just does it for me. And with that, if I press that option, I get it at a discounted rate through the exchange, through the wallet, and through the merchant, so it gives everyone an incentive to have a, a replace option, but done through the wallet. So I've actually talked to a lot of wallets about this. Um, I've actually gone out of my way outside of my role at Coinbase to talk to wallet makers and see what features we can do to make the spend and replace paradigm much easier. And I think some of the wallet vendors are looking at tokenization as ways to provide those incentives. You look at what Bread Wallet is doing with the BRD token, and they're offering 0% uh, exchange from fiat. If you have a certain amount of bread, that's one of their goals moving forward. I think these types of incentives are actually extremely powerful. And being able to have watch-only wallets using just XPUB keys makes it really easy for me to track what your expenditure is and then automatically go ahead and refill that through some service. And I think that that's coming. I think that that has been discussed by a number of wallet vendors. But I think the infrastructure is just kind of getting built out now. Um, we're just starting to see good buy and sell features natively in your average wallet, uh, not just a brokerage product wallet. And I think that will continue to expand with services and integrations like Simplex, et cetera, that are trying to provide that to the wallet makers today. Quick question, just to confirm, you said Bread was going to allow a discount on trading to fiat as a yeah, broker? I believe it was a discount on purchasing on the fiat to crypto conversion based on uh, rewards from their Bread token. So if you had enough Bread, then they would offer these incentives, and that was one of the examples of incentives that they were talking about within okay. their wallet. So tokens and the idea of basically customer loyalty in the form of a token, I think, will be more prevalent moving forward. Does that mean that bread is an exchange? They're going to be. Well, that they want to be the, the the large decentralized exchange. They're oh, adding okay. those assets. Got so it. That's kind of their their vision now. Yep. Uh, I don't want to speak for them. I'm of sure course. that they will talk about more of those <laughs> things in the future. Absolutely. Thank you. Any others? All right. I'm coming to you. I think the black market is just a diffemism for the free market. Um, so at the end of the day, but at the end of the day, it's up to all of us with good morals and values to condemn things that are being sold on the black market that are immoral. So assassinations, don't, don't kill people, right? It shouldn't be complicated. Um, but if you want to buy a plant that makes you feel happy, go for it. If you want to buy a white powder that makes you feel happy, go for it. Uh, and anybody who wants to stop you from doing those things, those are the bad people. 
with the misguided set of moral values that should be stopped and hopefully can be stopped thanks to the invention of cryptocurrencies. So the more black markets that start using cryptocurrencies in journal, fantastic. Uh, I think that's a great thing. And it was actually thanks to uh, the Silk Road that I heard about Bitcoin for the very first time. It was a new story in regards to that. And uh, I've never been interested in drugs myself. I've never tried any illegal drugs and rarely drink alcohol, never tried a cigarette. But when I heard about this magic money that was allowing people to buy drugs on the internet, I didn't think what type of drugs. I said, what kind of money is this? <laughs> and that's why I got involved in Bitcoin. Yeah. Also, you know, if you, if you look at all technology, it seems that uh, uh, those sorts of things, the sin industries, you know, porn and gambling, you know, they always try out these new technologies and that's where things kind of take off. So, um, you know, free market, black market, uh, I mean, as Roger said, I think a lot of us remember Silk Road being this incredible story, not just because it was drugs, but because it had this weird internet money. So um, I'm happy for, for uh, uh, those sorts of industries to stimulate the use of these things if it means that eventually the technology trickles out into the rest of us and we can benefit from it. Black markets, um, you, independently of whether or not you think they should exist, they perform a very vital information signaling. Uh, if a currency is capable of, uh, if, if a black market is capable of using a currency, like Roger said, what kind of money is this? So the existence of a black market tells you that you have a certain amount of resiliency in your currency that you wouldn't have if it wasn't possible to run it. So um, if we're looking to make something like Bitcoin Cash into a global currency, then it should be at least as, as useful for crime as the U.S. dollar is. You know, if, it's, if it can't match the dollar, then it's not going to take over. That's pretty good logic. Josh? So to me, I think that uh, focusing on the term dark net markets or uh, black markets is really not the way that we should phrase it. Um, to me, we have amazing products out there that are peer-to-peer -peer commerce systems. And that's what a, a dark market really is, is something where me and you can choose to trade goods. And we have people that are building those systems today. We had presentations from Open Bazaar. That's not a black market. That's allowing us to trade freely with one another and accept cryptocurrencies. And it's really important to phrase things correctly and base it on the intent of what you want. It's not about trading illicit goods. It's about the freedom to trade goods with your peers without an intermediary and do for money, uh, do for commerce like we did for money with cryptocurrencies. And I think that should be the way that we describe it. And that way we don't get that illicit connotation. I just want to trade with my friends if I want to. And it shouldn't matter what I'm trading. And I can trade any good and service I want. Woo! Without permission. There you go. Go ahead, Ken. Yeah. I'm not so familiar with black market, but uh, maybe with uh, porn uh, industry. There you go. Um, I mean, uh, Japanese porn is kind of popular, uh, but uh, but uh, reality is that um, and uh, you know, beautiful girls usually can smell money, but. <laughs> But reality is that uh, porn industry haven't really started using Bitcoin Cash yet. So that really means we really have a lot of work to do with UX. Right? There you go. Yeah. So we, we still have <laughs> a lot a of work. Not a good substitute. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ken. All right, question? You're the next for the job. <laughs> All right, we got another question. Uh, I got to go down. Coming down, I'm coming down. Uh, the, talk, the talk earlier with uh, Coinbase, we talked about how there's really non-trivial amounts of money now uh, in custody with exchanges and now with you know, like hedge funds and things getting into cryptocurrency. I did a blog post and I think Coinbase probably stores more US dollars uh, than the gold reserves of Belgium. So that's all countries except for about 20. Uh, how can we mitigate in terms of you know, like state-sponsored kidnapping, private kidnapping, confiscation, how can we mitigate against state actors seizing some of that money as it gets into these large uh, sponsored regulated institutions. So since you brought up Coinbase, I guess I'll go ahead and jump in on that one. Um, it's 
It's a really hard problem, and to me, it's really making sure that you're working with regulators. Right now, at this point, there's enough money and liquidity in the markets that working with the regulators and governments is absolutely required to make sure that you can have a sustainable business model that can hold that number of assets. Working with and making sure that you're insuring those assets to the best of your ability and making sure that if a black swan event happens to your exchange, that you're out there to protect your customers in the best way you can is absolutely essential. And that's why when you're picking your exchange and where you're going to store your funds and when you're looking at custody, reputation, their security systems, their relationship with the government institutions, the level of wanting to play with the existing system so that the system understands you're not working against them, but working with them to push the industry forward is absolutely essential. Keeping your money on an exchange that uh, gloats about the fact that they don't want to work with regulators is just it, it's a risk proposition. Why would you do that? You, they've just put a giant target on their head on why they should be shut down. And so I think that those relationships are essential and uh, that's part of the reason I decided to go to Coinbase is I think that uh, that balance is something they do extremely well. They believe in a crypto future, but they also understand the realities of working with the government institutions that are necessary in the world today to play along with. And that way we can guide regulation, make sure it's fair, and make sure that this market is an orderly one that is something that can continue to grow. One of the ways that people can reduce their exchange risk is by not using exchanges. So if you're going from the, uh, the paradigm of somebody has a big pile of dollars and they convert it to bitcoins, yeah, that's going to leave a trail and there's going to be risk of that information leaking at some point. Uh, people who earn their bitcoin through commerce, through, uh, through uh, freelancing, from uh, contracting, they are not as exposed to exchanges, especially the more they are able to pay their expenses in Bitcoins too and just live Bitcoin natively. So that, that category of users, which should grow over time, is not gonna have the same uh, risk profile as uh, currency speculators who are moving between the fiat and the Bitcoin. Absolutely, I have to just say that I completely agree with that. Um, it's all about the supply chain and where you're getting your money. If you can start getting paid in crypto or working for crypto, then you're not touching anything that needs to transfer value. You're in a much better place. It's A, it's more anonymous. You get better pseudo-anonymity as you don't have to give up your identity. And then those, those transactions are truly you know, just between you and that other party. And we really need to strive to get there. But it's a lot easier for us sitting in this room, in this space right now, to get to that world where we can get paid either partially or entirely in cryptocurrency. Um, for most of the world, we're just not there yet. And uh, we need to be able to facilitate better tools to get there. And right now, those exchanges are where they're getting that liquidity, even if they're going to pay you in Bitcoin. Because unless they're connected to the miners, they have to buy their Bitcoin somewhere. And so we're stuck in a position where that full circle, that entire money, monetary cycle, hasn't really been fulfilled. And that's something we need to think about as a community to fill in those gaps. Thank you. Questions? Okay. Um, talking about adoption, uh, I'm just wondering uh, if there's any concerted effort to partner with mobile payment operators in various countries. I'm the CEO of uh, VT Network Limited in Nigeria. I also run, I also run uh, a mobile payment gateway in the US. Uh, we do clearing for Western Union and many other remittance companies. Now, the challenge is I understand Bitcoin, I've been following Bitcoin for a very long time, but the challenge is we operate in a very regulated environment uh, for some reason. I was listening to George, uh, he actually made a you know, very important point about user experience. So because we already operate in a, in a um, regulated environment, that the way we look at Bitcoin and certain things that we can actually uh, partner on might be different from the core Bitcoin users. And because when you operate in a regulated environment, you have to absolutely 
uh, take cognizance of what the government is telling you regarding you know, identification for a certain amount of uh, transactions and so on and so forth. So my question really is for uh, Bitcoin Cash to really take a second look at what it would take to actually create this adoption by looking at, at the existing web payment operators. Number two is the issue of speed. In a situation whereby you process over 500,000 a month, how would that work speed-wise on Bitcoin Cash? So uh, we, we are uh, uh, in discussions with uh, one of the largest mo uh, money um, uh, mobile operators in Africa and uh, also with uh, the Reserve Bank of uh, South Africa and other reserve banks. And, uh, what we, and uh, it's been a long process because uh, there's had to be a lot of education around how the technology works and so on. Um, but uh, what we've realized is that uh, it's actually you know, not very hard to imagine uh, uh, an operator like yourself taking on a cryptocurrency as, because there are a lot of regulations uh, uh, in terms of KYC and AML that exist already. So uh, really what you're doing is you're just using the cryptocurrency as a rail. And as long as uh, you are complying with all the regulations around uh, source of funds and so on and deposit taking, then uh, it shouldn't really be a, a, a very difficult process to incorporate a cryptocurrency as a rail, as an actual uh, a transfer rail. But that is really dependent on the regulators becoming educated around that. So now in South Africa, uh, uh, it's, we're in a privileged place, and I think that a lot of African countries look to the regulators in South Africa, you know, uh, because you know it's such a dominant uh, economy. That uh, right now, I, I'm pleased to tell you that they are about to uh, publish a new uh, uh, perspective on on cryptocurrency. They had one published in 2014, and that's since changed. And I think that uh, uh, what we're going to see is a new set of guidelines that are going to come out now, which uh, which sort of explains how these cryptocurrencies will fit in the in the context of the existing uh, uh, policies. Now, it's always difficult to create new policies. That takes many years. So I think that uh, what we're going to see now is that uh, uh, as long as you comply with those existing regulations around cryptocurrency uh, around money and so on, uh, you'll be fine. And now, in terms of the speed. You know, uh, we, we've had a conference about uh, uh, Bitcoin Cash and, um, uh, and this whole notion of zero confirmation or uh, a transaction. And uh, I think that uh, as we see now going ahead with Bitcoin Cash, that those transactions can be more reliable. And as, as uh, researchers in the space uh, that are here, many of them are here today, uh, uh, to start uh, uh, publishing papers on the reliability of accepting zero confirmations up to certain thresholds, then I think that whole speed thing is, is a non-issue. I think that's really been the whole point of this conference is to show that Bitcoin Cash has really solved that problem. So I think that is a problem that you really don't have to uh, worry about. But definitely... Uh, look to uh, the South African Reserve Bank. They're about to uh, publish this, their, their uh, outlook. And uh, I think that's going to accelerate things rapidly as long as your regulators uh, take the, what, what's being published uh, uh, seriously. So, uh, again, we're, we're now in, in talks with a large um, um, mobile operator right now, and I think we're going to be doing that. We're going to be using them, uh, uh, and they're going to be using our technology to move uh, money cross-border. So I think it's very exciting in the months to come. All right. Woo. Thank you. I used to work for a carrier, um, phone care company called Singapore Telecom, and uh, I used to stalk uh, CEO on and senior management on Twitter, and I worked with SoftBank, so I used to, you know, stalk Mr. Masayoshi Son because they already call SoftBank, right? So all this I've been uh, tweeting for years, but. Um, I still think uh, the, my better bet is to convince uh, physical mom and dad shops and get one shops uh, on board accepting Bitcoin Cash. Um, I never thought we get back to the street to do this again. <laughs> we used to do with Roger back in the day, but uh, yeah, I think that's a better bet. Got it. All right. I'm going to ask you guys to wrap us up and tell us one thing you want us to do as we leave here today to further adoption of Bitcoin Cash. You get to tell us just to do one thing. All right, who wants to go first? 
Give somebody else Bitcoin Cash. Boom. And uh, one millionth uh, denomination to be called as cash. <laughs> yeah. There we go. Tell everybody, tell your friends, tell your family, tell your mother, tell your father, tell your dog, tell your cat. Tell everybody and don't just tell them about it. Set them up with a Bitcoin Cash wallet and show them how to use it. Spend a couple, take a couple moments out of your day and show them how to use it. So that's the next step. There you go. Thank you. Roger. I guess mine, mine is really just for uh, wallet implementers. Uh, if you have a wallet and you don't implement BIP47 yet, get in contact with one of us. Uh, we're going to form an implementer working group to uh, you know, help, help get, this, uh, get this thing deployed. Awesome. Thank you very much, Eustace. Bit 47. So definitely echo the sentiment from these others. Uh, personally, uh, one of the things you can do for your own social group is when you go out to dinner and someone owes you money, don't take fiat. They have to pay you back in Bitcoin Cash. And that for them to pay them in Bitcoin Cash. That works too. So it's like, oh, I'm going to pay you back for that. Here's some Bitcoin Cash. Or, oh, man, I covered dinner. You owe me 10 bucks. Man, send that to me in Bitcoin Cash. And start changing your social, social group and encourage them to do the same. Woo! A round of applause for our panel. Thank you very much. Thank you.